that really fought so hard to make it through after Tyler took his life. And I read all the reports the next couple of weeks about the great kid Tyler was. And I said, no, I'm gonna stay here and tell my story. Uh, I don't wanna be taking my own life and then having everybody talk about how great a guy I was. No, no, I'll talk about that. I'll let people know I made it through difficult times and I'm here to tell the story and to let them know also that they can make it through these very difficult times too. James Donaldson is in the midst of his second run for mayor of Seattle. James is a former NBA player, a former business owner of 28 years, and a current advocate for mental health awareness and suicide prevention. Our topics included guidance for young men, male friendships, masculinity, homelessness and policing in Seattle, suicide and race, the achievement gap for African American boys, and bringing back the Sonics. First, we talked about men and mental illness. I know that you suffered some very difficult life circumstances in recent years, and you went through a year-long period of depression. I understand during that time you thought about ending your own life. So I've heard you talk about how men in particular need to uh, need encouragement that it's okay to be vulnerable, it's okay to show weakness, and especially it's okay to ask for help when we're struggling with our feelings. Men are known to be less proactive at seeking out treatment for mental illness. Why are we this way? Well, I think it's the way a lot of us are raised. Uh, most people just say, hey, you're a boy, don't cry, suck it up, be tough, and boys don't cry. And so we grow up with that kind of thing, that mindset. Uh, and I think it's even worse for uh, athletes, competitive athletes. Uh, we really put this shield up of invincibility and, and, and vulnerability. Uh, nothing can hurt us. I will never let you know if I'm, if I'm hurting or if I'm sick or I'm gonna compete, I'm gonna play, I'm not gonna cry, I'm not gonna, go, not gonna complain. So that's, that's kind of the men's makeup. And maybe it goes back to our old caveman days where we were just relied upon to, you know, be the provider, the protector, going out there fighting the, uh, you know, the big bears and saber tooth tigers and things, protecting the family and not really crying about it, just going and doing it. And therefore, to this day, you know, this is still kind of the role that we play instinctively. My whole thing is trying to get men to say it's okay to, to feel bad or to cry or to ask for help. It's totally okay. And that's what I want to make some more progress on throughout you know, my remaining years of working in this field of mental health awareness and suicide prevention. I see. Yeah, I would imagine maybe in team sports in particular, if you're a man mm -hmm. who's relied upon as a teammate, you might be even less uh, prone or less willing to admit vulnerability because you don't want to let your, your brothers down. That's, that's exactly right. And or if you take time off from your competitive sport, uh, you lose your place on the team. Uh -huh. you know, you're, so you have a lot to risk by showing weakness, showing fatigue, showing that you can't do the job. Uh, military personnel is the same way. I have a, uh, a talk coming up at JBLM uh, in September for National Suicide Prevention Month in September. And the same thing with military personnel. They, uh, if they show and report uh, mental challenges or illness or anything like that, they could very well lose their firearms and not be able to brandish them during their time in the military. Uh, that's a big fear for men, especially because it kind of de de demasculates you, demasculates you. Uh, you're no longer able to compete at the same level as the other guys are you're at this other level and that's that's a hard thing for a man's ego to take. Wow, that hadn't occurred to me. In the military, you're if you if you demonstrate mental illness, they're likely to say we can't I'm sorry but we can't rely on you to deploy and to be part of this mission because we have to just send people that we know are 100%. That's right. Or even or even train with firearms. They would take those firearms away. They wouldn't allow you to participate in those trainings. So, you know, you re relying to some, uh, some desk duty job, which isn't what most of the guys enlist in the military for. Are there any methods that you think are especially effective at getting through to men or young men in particular about the importance of asking for help when they're feeling unwell? Have you noticed any patterns about what tends to be most effective at flipping the switch in men's minds where they begin to think, I'm not going to hide how I'm feeling anymore I'm going to have the guts to ask for help. 
Yeah, I, the thing I found, I think men need a safe place to feel vulnerable, to let their guard down, let their hair down a little bit. Uh, they need a place where they won't feel judged. Uh, they won't feel ridiculed or ashamed. And um, they have to be able to carve out that place amongst a, a, a small handful of intimate friends who know them very well. And these are the friends you have to keep close to you because when you do go through your difficult times, they remember you when you were flying high and everything was going great. Now they see you down into depths of things. The same way with my intimate group of friends I had around me coming through. Uh, and they, they knew that when I reached out to them and when I told them what I was going through and that I needed them, uh, you know, to call and check on me time to time because no one else was calling at the time. My life was totally bleak and dark and, and lonely and I needed them to call me and check on me. And I wanted to see if I could call them at one or two in the morning. So that's the safe place that I carved out for myself. I never felt judged. I never felt ridiculed or ashamed because these were dear friends for 30 or 40 years, each of them. And so I think men need to do the same thing for themselves. It helps when men talk to men. Uh, I've got a lot of great mentors in my life that I can feel very comfortable reaching out and talking to. Guys who are older than I am, uh, guys who are my same age. Um, and it just gives you a sense of, wow, there's an innate understanding. Uh, you know, women are great and they do a lot of great things for everything and everybody. But there's a lot of things that they just cannot quite relate to when, uh, when men are talking to men about men's things. We know exactly and intuitively what we are talking about. And that's, what, that's a great help for men. I remember when I was feeling depressed, it seemed like things were so dark that I thought everyone else was probably experiencing that same level of darkness, even though mm -hmm. that's of course not true. But when I assume that everyone else is experiencing that, that same level of darkness, it, it feels like I don't want to burden other people with my problems because yeah. they're probably, you know, the world is so bleak to them too. And that, that's not, that's not reality. When our mental health is good, we're capable of taking on other people's burdens for a while and, and, you know, having people bring to us their struggles and be able to help them. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, uh, I know when I was going through my period of darkness, I felt I was the only one going through it. You know, I, I didn't, I'd see other people out across the street or in restaurants or coffee shops. And it seemed like they had their life together. They're laughing they're joyful. I'm like, wow, why can't I laugh? Why don't I have any joy? And that was really what was bugging me for all those months. But, um, you know, we do have to realize that we're not alone, though. That's, that's a major thing. And men, men, seem to want, men tend to want to go through this by themselves and alone, uh, by not telling anybody, and by, by getting themselves involved with uh, very self-destructive behaviors sometimes, uh, be it you know, drugs or alcohol. These are solitary, uh, you know, activities most of the time. Um, you know, promiscuous behaviors, all the strip, bar, uh, strip, strip bars, all the, all the clubs, uh, gambling. And these are things you don't normally tell, your, tell people that you're doing, in excess especially. But all of a sudden, this picks up because it's a way for us to try to buffer that pain and, and get away from that pain, even if it's temporary. And sometimes it's, it's basically an alternative method of suicide that wouldn't be called suicide if you drank yourself to death, for example, or overdosed on drugs. But it's, yeah. it's a way of escaping the pain, which is kind of comparable to suicide. Yeah, in a way. Yeah, you're definitely escaping, but it's only temporary. Uh, you know, that, that old uh, thoughts and tendencies are going to come back. And, uh, you know, there's a great saying I like to use. It says, a suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. So the depression is temporary. Now, some people are depressed for years and, and maybe even decades but they need to get help. They need to be in therapy, they need to be in counseling. But suicide is a permanent solution that you don't ever want to enact. There are a variety of ways in which young men today aren't doing so well, whether we're talking about poor performance in school, various kinds of addictions, failure to launch, and all kinds of confusion over what it means to be a man and how to become a good grown man. Where are some good places for boys and young men to turn for guidance on becoming mature men? especially maybe for boys who don't have good dads in their lives. This generation of young people that we've raised up, 
so many of them uh, grew up in the era where everybody gets a trophy, you know, just because you showed up, just because you're on a team. Uh, you know, you're playing Little League Baseball and your team's up by 15 runs. They call the game. Everybody, nobody gets embarrassed. And so we never really learn the hardships of life um, this way. And when hard times do come, and believe me, they will come at some point, uh, we've got to be able to face that and endure that. I think team sports is a great thing, a character builder for every young person. Uh, they should all be trying to play team sports. It teaches you, you know, the teamwork, uh, working together as a team towards common goals, uh, lessons in winning, lessons in losing. Uh, the euphoria of being together, the camaraderie, all these great things is what team sports teaches you. The military is a similar kind of thing as well, uh, because these two aspects and activities provide some really good discipline and structure in a young person's life, which I think a lot of them are missing on, out on now. Um, you, know, you can't just you know, play video games your whole life and be kind of solitary and still have have expected to have the social skills developed that you need when you get out there in real life. So I think there's a lot of great places for young men to still learn that pathway, that rite of passage to manhood. Uh, mentoring groups are fine. Have a, have a mentor who's older than you and been around a little bit. Uh, the scouting troops are a good way to learn activities to get out there, experience some hardships of sleeping outside, you know, uh, you know, we all been scouts way back when and, uh, you know, learning some of the hardships of, of roughing it a little bit. So yeah, those those are great ways to do it. And if you don't have a, a responsible older role model in your life, especially for boys, uh, seek one out. Try to find either through the scouting troops or through the mentoring agencies around town. There are a lot of great men out there that want to give back their their wisdom and their life experience to a young man. And that would really help the young man make that passageway to manhood. Wonderful. Yeah. I'm 33. And through the Big Brothers Big Sisters program, I was matched with a seven-year-old boy down in Renton. So Wonderful. I've been in a relationship with him for about uh, four or five months. And it's, it's great because I've, I've known since I was in my early 20s that I would be a pretty good dad. I wanted to be a dad. So I was yeah. a 33-year-old man with no kids. And, and maybe within a few years, I will have kids. But for now, I, ha I have some wisdom and I have some kind of yep. care to offer. So why not offer that to a boy who doesn't have a dad in his life? Absolutely. And, and that experience for that seven-year-old boy is just going to be invaluable. As he grows up, he looks up to you, respects you, he likes you, he wants to see you, he wants to learn from you. I mean, this responsibility on you as well. But, you know, you seem to be the character that can handle that kind of responsibility and make sure that this young boy grows up with a really positive male role model in his life. That's, that's essential. For most men, there's something special about time spent with just other men. Our relationships yeah. with our close male friends are critical to feeling accepted among the community of men and for avoiding isolation. Can you talk about some of the positive, uplifting experiences you had as an adult in your friendships with other men? Mm, oh, of course. Yeah. I've got a tremendous group of men friends around town. And, uh, you know, one thing about those men, you know, once we get past the surfacey talk uh, of talking about girls or cars or money or job, you know, we start talking about real things, get below the surface. Now we really start to get to know each other. And it's amazing how many people really don't know each other that well, other than those surfacey kind of conversations. I like to go deep in my conversations. I like to talk about your family and your upbringing and your dreams and all those kind of great things that uh, really make a person whole. Uh, you know, a couple of my, my greatest mentors and friends have been some of my old basketball coaches. Uh, these are guys now in their mid eighties, uh, you know, grandfatherly types, that, but I knew them 40 years ago when I was coming through university and just starting my professional basketball career. Uh, guys like Lenny Wilkins, who used to coach the Seattle Supersonics. I, I have breakfast with Lenny every month, and we just talk and talk and talk. And, you know, he takes me back to the 50s and the 60s when he was just coming up as a young man in the, you know, segregated South. And when there really was institutional racism and systemic racism, uh, now we call it that, but it was nothing like back in the 50s and 60s. 
um, you know, George Ravling, my old uh, WSU basketball coach, a great, great dear friend. Now these guys were coaches and mentors for years, but as we got older, they became friends. You know, we, we I still call them both coach, but you know, that's out of respect. And that's because they continue teaching me things about life that, uh, that I'm gonna go through and we're all gonna go through. I remember George Rappling telling me during the midst of my depression, you know, and uh, I was really struggling and I, had, I was 60 years old. I was, yeah, just turned 60. And George Rappling told me, it's like, James, you know, I coached for four decades and I never reached the pinnacle of the heights of my profession. And my real breakthrough didn't come through I was, until I was 63 years old when I went to work for Nike Global International. And that's where he still is 20 years later working with Nike. Um, and he told me, hey, you just have to hang in there. You cannot give up. Matter of fact, I'm not gonna let you give up. And you know, he, it sounded like back in 1975, you know, when I was with WSU, uh, here he is coaching me still, I'm not gonna let you give up. And uh, he kept checking in on me. He kept, he kept his word to keep me on track. And he was always there for me throughout. So. That's what a really good friend does for you. And us men, we need to get beyond the surface you talk and sit down and just talk with each other, deep below the surface. Build that bond, that relationship, and it will never go away. It'll always be there with you. And it's something that you'll definitely need uh, as you go on through this journey of life. Thank you. One of my sort of substitute father figures has, was a, a college professor of mine because my parents divorced when I was 14 and I haven't had much of a relationship with my dad since then. Mm -hmm. I, I went to Whitworth over in Spokane. Sure. I had an economics professor named Dr. Schatz and he and I became very close. So when I got married, he gave the toast uh, like from my side of the family at the wedding. And I still oh. call him professor or Dr. Schatz, even though we're much more like father and son. That's right. Yes, exactly. That's exactly the relationship I think all of us men need. And we crave if our father is still on around. My, now, my dad's still around. He's 94 years old now, uh, you know, but he's getting a little uh, mentally in, incapacitated a little bit, declining slightly. So he can't have the long conversations we used to have. But my dad was there with me throughout all my growing up years. Uh, I, I was raised in a two, two parent household. My mother, my father, education was really stressed. So I had a good foundation to start my childhood and my young adulthood off with, which unfortunately so many young kids don't have. And that's really, uh, that's really too bad, but it's, it's not the end of the world. You know, it's something that you can find substitute pieces to replace and to support all that, and you'll be just fine. It's been said that there's a crisis of masculinity today some people think we need to tone down masculinity in our culture and others say we have too many men lacking masculinity. What does masculinity mean to you? And do you think of yourself as a masculine man? What are some times you can recall feeling masculine and other times uh, if it's happened that you've felt emasculated? Yeah, well, that's a good question and uh, kind of a multifaceted question. Um, yeah, I do feel like a masculine kind of old style traditional man, uh, the strong silent type, uh, the chivalrous type. I mean, I still open up car doors for the lady. I open up, you know, I let her enter first. Uh, I, I make sure that I am paying attention uh, to her needs and being very chivalrous with that. I mean, that's just the way I grew up. It's the way I've always been. And uh, I think that that's a real man who is able to continually show those kind of things, not just occasionally, but you know, on a consistent basis. Uh, I tell a lot of folks I'm, a, I'm an old fashioned traditional guy, but with a, with a modern twist, you know, I mean, I am, I'm up to date enough on all the, all the modern stuff, but old fashioned, but with a modern flair, I like to call it. Um, so, you know, I know what's happening. I know what's going on. I'm, still young enough to be, you know, hip and, and up to date with all the technologies and everything else. So that's no problem for me, but I still like the old fashioned chivalrous kind of a guy. You know, I'm a Christian man. I, I grew up in a church. I still go to church every Sunday. So I have Christian values of a family, uh, the man being the head of the family, 
uh, you know, and but the man also being the support of the whole family and taking care of working side by side with his wife to make sure that the whole family flourishes. So those kind of things. I don't want to be a, a dictator type making all the decisions and no one else has a say in anything. No, you know, this, this is an equal and even playing field. But at, at, at the time when somebody has to take the lead, that's when I, I do take the lead, I tend to. So that's what I mean by being a masculine man. Um, I'm not afraid to cry. Uh, I'm not afraid to walk with my little dog who has a, you know, a pink collar and a pink leash. And here I am with a little bitty dog and everybody's laughing. That's totally fine, you know? Uh, so I don't get caught up in all those kind of things. I, I really pay attention to, you know, the real deal. What's really, what really matters most. That's the level of um, masculine self-confidence that is ideal to reach where you're not worried about people's perceptions of you walking around with a small dog with a pink collar because that's you know that that's just so surface level. And anyone who actually knows you will know yeah. that you exemplify um, an ad admirable traits of a grown man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in a way, it kind of softens me and makes me a little bit more approachable by everybody out there in the neighborhood. Uh, because here I am, a you know, big, huge guy, I'm seven foot two, you know, African American guy. So I'm a big guy and can be intimidating if you don't know me or if I'm not smiling, if I come you know, frowning at you, that might be intimidating. So I, I've learned over my 63 years of you know, how to navigate easily through society, what the, what the norms are, what the expectations are, what the perceptions are. Uh, and I've been able to really uh, work well with those kind of things um, because I try to think of others first. I don't want to think about me all the time. This is, you know, what would I think if I saw some guy nine feet tall? I mean, I'd, I'd be the same way, uh, you know? So I, I realize how people must feel and I want to make sure that I put them at ease and at comfort as much as possible. Yeah, I mean, that, that is how I, I think mature adults operate in the world is to not primarily think about how the world should revolve around us, but put ourselves in the shoes of other people and think, uh, what must they be experiencing and what things can I do to help yeah. break the ice? That's um, right. Yeah, bring down any kind of suspicion of each other and yeah. you know, basically be able to have mature interactions. That's exactly right. But that's one of the issues we have with our younger generation. They kind of grew up in this me generation, me first. It's all about me. Uh, social media came about and all of a sudden everybody's got their own platform, their own stage, and they have their own voice. Uh, and so it's easy to not think about others when you are the star of your own show. Um, you know, we all are in this big planet together. And we all have to figure out a way to get along. And I tell everybody, I say, hey, I can get along with anybody anywhere in the world, one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And I think all of us can if we just take that moment to do that. But it's easy to get wrapped up into the group think and the mob mentality and the group, group mentality and not really think for yourself, but just kind of become a part of this, this conglomerate of people that are all thinking or acting a certain way. Uh, you know, I think it's good to be able to think and think critically and think clearly uh, about your everyday actions. In a recent video, you talked about homelessness and policing as two major issues that you're concerned about. Uh, you're running for mayor of Seattle. Yeah. Uh, given that men are a majority of the homeless in Seattle and King County, and given that men are also a majority of police officers and criminals and people who experience violence from police, I would think that getting Seattle's homeless situation under control and getting Seattle's policing situation in better shape is going to have to involve helping men. Yeah, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, but, you know, these are two big, big issues going on in Seattle now. Uh, the lack of trust with our police officers and the homeless situation. Uh, last year, due to COVID, uh, our homeless situation just exploded by about 50% more to the population out in the streets, mainly due to the fact that, you know, our shelters and, and housing were all under CDC guidelines of social distancing. So the capacity, the amount of people they could take in dropped down by about 35%. And most of those people ended up on the street and then there are a lot more, a lot of new people who were added to the homeless population 
from out of town and elsewhere. Uh, my whole approach with the homeless population, though, is really uh, to humanize them. Uh, they are people, too. And I think we need to do a better job of uh, the city of Seattle, the mayor, for instance, going and actually talking to these people uh, and find out who they are. Put a name, a first and last name together with them, where they came from, what they might be suffering from. Is it alcohol abuse or substance abuse or are they running from the law? Uh, you know, what, whatever. And then be able to provide housing and the services on top of that. Uh, my big push would be for more affordable housing, more tiny home villages scattered throughout our city. I think every neighborhood needs to bear the brunt of some of this responsibility of housing and taking care of our homeless. But once we can get them off the streets and into a, a small setting of 20 or 30 or 40 people at a time, then we can provide the services much more efficiently on a rotating basis from the city of Seattle. So that's really my approach. I, I think it will work. I think most people, if given, given a home, I just saw a wonderful program last weekend on CBS Sunday morning about home first. And the first thing they, they, they supplied to the homeless person was a place to call home. Now that person is in off the street, they're no longer worried about their personal belongings being stolen or ruffled through. They're warm, they're clean, and now they're much more open to receiving those services that they need. So we have to have homes first and then be able to build on it from there. In regards to our policing, uh, you know, I am pro-police. I'm against defunding our police department. Uh, I think we need to continue training our, our police department. Uh, the, the police officers continue training, ongoing training. Uh, as it is, they don't get nearly enough training. Um, and so I, if, if I was mayor, would make sure that we, uh, one of my programs I talk about now is every three months, uh, you have your officer come in off the street and into a classroom setting where for one week they're in a classroom and they, they are distressing. They're learning all the latest policies and procedures and techniques and and they can see a mental health counselor during that week if they need to talk about their family life, talk about the stress they're under. And then after a week, they're ready to get back out there on the street and they're no longer, you know, uh, trigger happy for lack of a better word. They're no longer so jittery and jumpy at every, everything. They've calmed down a little bit and do this every three months, bring them in, give them something different to do let them rest, let them de-stress, and then put them back out there. We need to build our police department up again. We only have about a thousand police officers in Seattle right now. Uh, that's down from a normal number of about 1,600 officers. Uh, last year in the COVID year 2020, we lost over 200 officers due to retirement and transfer and all those kind of things. We've already lost another 100 officers this year, the same kind of thing, transfers and retirement. So we need to build back up our police force and we can only do that by recruiting good officers, uh, probably having to pay some kind of sign-on bonus. Uh, but in exchange for that sign-on bonus, I would require and request that they have to sign an agreement to stay with our Seattle Police Department for at least two years. That's, so we're gonna train you and we're gonna give you a bonus, $25,000, $50,000. You are committed to our city of Seattle for at least two years. And that way we don't end up just training them and they run off to another surrounding city here for a less uh, strenuous job. So uh, I think our police officers need to get out of their patrol cars and get back to community policing. Um, we need to see our officers. We need to see who they are. Uh, you can't see them behind those dark tinted glass windows that they drive with their cars up and down the roads. Get out. Walk your beat in your neighborhood, let the kids see you, get to know people by the first and last name, they get to know you, uh, ride your bicycle if you want to, uh, take off some of this gear that you're wearing, they all wear so much uh, layers and layers of what looks like riot gear, I call them uh, super ninja turtle outfits because they got everything going on, uh, you don't need that to walk your neighborhood, and I think the neighbors would appreciate that, uh, the kids, would have somebody else positive in their life coming by, checking on them, saying hi to them. Uh, and better than bicycles is to put, put our police officers on horseback. 
wow, a big old police horse come galloping down your street. All the kids would come out to say hi and wander about the horse and ask questions. And it's a great way to build this community relationship back again. So those are the things I have in mind for our police department. So every year they conduct counts of the number of people experiencing homelessness in yes. Seattle and King County. And when the nonprofits and government agencies write up reports about what that data shows, they tend to give attention to the fact that homelessness disproportionately affects um, people of color and uh, people identifying as LGBTQ+. But I seldom, if ever, see them draw attention to the fact that homelessness disproportionately affects men. So in other words, there's a homelessness gender gap that receives um, not so much attention. So those of us who advocate for men's well-being and equal treatment for men, we've noticed the social, uh, uh, sorry, we've noticed the societal reluctance sometimes to acknowledge sex-based sex disparities or gender gaps where males are most impacted. Yeah. And of course, suicide is a, a major example and then homelessness is quite a in, in our face example too. Uh, everyone in Seattle knows about the homelessness problem, but we don't think of it as a, a gender inequity. No, we don't tend to. Um, I think most people feel like men can fend for themselves out there. I mean, especially if they choose to be out on the streets. I don't know who in their right mind would choose to live on the streets, but some people actually do. Um, but when we see a woman out there on the streets, homeless, especially with a child or two, uh, we tend to have a lot more compassion for her. We tend to make sure that she has a place to stay, to be safe and out of the elements and the kids can be safe as well. That's just kind of our human nature of our society and our, our social beings. Um, yes, men do make up a, a much larger percentage of the homeless population, uh, but I think that we tend to, you know, we don't tend to have the same amount of compassion for them. I've met several homeless folks who, you know, used to work for Boeing, for instance, for 25 years. They lost their job when they got near retirement. Uh, they ran into financial challenges. They lost their home, and now they're on the street. You know, and these are guys in their 50s and 60 years of age. Um, and that's just a shame, you know, because obviously they're not suffering from mental health or drug problems or anything like this. We should be able to get those kind of folks on their feet pretty quickly get them another job and a place to live. So this is what I mean by really going and identifying each and every one of our, well, the number range from 10 to 14,000 people on the streets of Seattle. Uh, we need to know who each and every one of them are and be able to provide whatever services they need to help them get back on their feet and back to a life of productivity and joy and happiness and safety and comfort. Suicide is one of the starkest examples of a gender inequity where men are the gender that's worse off. CDC data show that in Washington state, overall suicides are three to one male to female. And if you look at youth suicides, those up to age 25, it's four to one male to female. Yeah, that's true. You know, but there are far more, uh, you know, three or four times more women that attempt suicide, but men have a more lethal means to do it. And when they attempt it, they're usually, I don't want to say successful, but they usually carry it through and uh, accomplish a suicide. Women, they try various things. They may have four or five, six attempts and never really uh, you know, actually commit suicide. So that's the disparity. Far more women attempt it. Men, they do it and they're done. And we have much more lethal means. We have handguns, we have uh, you know, ropes, we have all kinds of things. Women, they rely on you know, sleeping pills or uh, medication overdoses, those, those kind of things. CDC data shows that white people are a significantly higher proportion of overall suicides than their proportion of the population, and black people are a slightly lower proportion of suicides than their proportion of the population. This is true both in Washington state and nationally. Um, in your learning about suicide prevention, had you come across this particular racial disparity before? Not necessarily. Uh, in my learning of all this, but I, I grew up, of course, in a African-American community down in South Sacramento, where I grew up. Uh, and back then, 70s and 80s, uh, mental health just was not talked about. Uh, black people, it was said often, black people don't commit suicide. That's a white person thing. See, so black folks had this whole stigma and this taboo 
of not committing suicide, not taking their lives. Uh, we're very religious people, so to speak. We turn everything over to God. God will take care of me. God will watch me. God, God doesn't want me to end my life. And those kind of things, I think, help us to keep our numbers uh, relative, uh, relatively low in, uh, in a ratio compared to uh, the white population. But uh, I think we're losing some of that now. I think now um, there are so many other issues at play. Uh, for instance, I don't think church and religion play as, as, as vital a part in our society as it used to. Um, a lot of people don't go to church anymore. Uh, first time in the United States history of keeping track of the statistics, only 47% of the US citizens go to church of any kind. And that's the first time it's been below 50% in you know, 100 years. And normally it's at 75% or so. So we're really losing our, our influence of the church and what those values mean and that somebody else is in, in greater control of our lives than we are. Uh, this all comes back to the me generation kind of thing. So uh, I think that's why you see that uh, Blacks proportionately don't quite commit the same amount of suicides, but we're getting there. Uh, you know, we have a problem with our, our transgender community committing suicides, especially uh, Black transgender folks. Uh, this was a big reason why uh, BLM, Black Lives Matter, started up with three tra transgender founders to help make sure that those lives matter and that people were there to support them. So, you know, the numbers are there. Uh, I'm always trying to reverse those numbers to get them down low as possible. And as I mentioned before, suicide should be never an option uh, and the last possible solution because it, it's the final one if you do enact it. So I have personally experienced three episodes of depression and each one lasted for about three months. And they occurred when I was age 17, 20, and 23. So I made it through each of those occurrences with a mix of medication, prayer, and counseling. And uh, in my case, medication has been very effective for me. I've been on low doses of two medications, lithium and lamotrigine, for over 10 years now, and I haven't had any depressive episodes. Oh, good. Uh, those drugs are regarded as, as safe, and they cause me no bothersome side effects. So after I'd had three episodes of depression, it just seemed to be a kind of a cyclical thing. My mom and I kind of decided together, it, it doesn't make sense to go off the medications if they're, they basically cost nothing, they have no long-term uh, health repercussions, there's no side effects. Why not just per try to prevent another episode of depression because depression is just terrible every minute yeah. of the day when you go through it. Oh, I know, yeah. And so for 10 years, 10 years you've been totally fine now. So that's great. And so, but, but um, I do, I remember when I was having suicidal ideations, the main way that I recall wanting to die was by jumping in front of a bus or a truck. Wow. And so now when I think about that, um, if I were to, do, if I were to have done that, that would actually have meant directly victimizing a second person in the act of my suicide, because of course it would be causing a great trauma to the driver of that vehicle who I just jumped in front of. Uh, yeah. so in the act of escaping my misery, I would have also vastly traumatized somebody else. That's uh, right. In the Como 4 video uh, with you and Eric Johnson, uh, it mentioned that one of the ways you contemplated trying to end your life was by attacking a cop in, in the hopes of getting shot dead. Can mm -hmm. you share more about what you were thinking at the time about that particular idea? Well, I knew that would be one surefire way to get me out of here without me, I'm not a, I'm not a gun, gun owner myself, so I don't have access to guns. Um, my other couple of ways were uh, by hanging by rope from rafters in my garage or a, a long rubber tube from my car exhaust into the car window and me just sitting in there for whatever time it took for me to pass away. So, you know, just thinking about those three methods, is, it's just... It, it, it makes me emotional just thinking that I was at that point at one point in time. Um, and that's, that's the danger of when you don't have a healthy mindset, uh, you can't think clearly. Uh, this is going back to our homeless issue. A lot of them don't have a healthy mindset. Of course, they cannot think clearly. Uh, my my uh, thoughts about attacking uh, a police officer or suicide by cop was that 
I knew, you know, and I follow, I've, I've studied all the social movements and racial issues of the day since my college days. I was a sociology and psychology major. So I studied a lot of these uh, social aspects that, um, and even though I have a lot of police officer friends in Seattle, uh, police officers, they wanna get home safely to their families too. Uh, they are putting their lives on the line just about every single day for us to protect and serve us. Um, I knew that being a extra large African-American man, uh, there would not be much mercy on me if I was coming at them with a great deal of rage and anger and really reaching for their gun, it wouldn't stop. Uh, the only way to stop me would have been to shoot me and most likely shoot me dead. Um, I, I, you know, I, I feel bad about even having those thoughts back in those times, 2018, but it's true and it's real. Um, we look at our, our shootings around the country of African-American men by police officers so many times. Uh, I wonder sometimes how many of them might be suicide by a cop, kind of cloaked under some aggression or some uh, an, you know, animated acts uh, resistance, running away. I just wonder sometimes how many of those are uh, suicide by cop, but just kind of put under several layers of other things. Did the black man want to live? Why is he resisting arrest? Uh, why is he not complying? What's going on in his mind? I mean, and so you, you, you can't help but think about these kind of things, what makes a person do some certain things. But that was my method and that's what I thought about. I also thought about the ramifications if I did go ahead and go through with that. It would have been another uh, black man being shot by a police officer. Um, national news, here I am a former NBA basketball player. It's national news, national headlines. It's, it's, it's controversial, it's strategy, it's conspiracies, it's all kinds of stuff and nobody would really know what happened except for me, and I'm no longer here to tell the story. Even the police officer wouldn't know why I attacked him. Uh, they would just know that I attacked and they, they did their job. So I didn't wanna put our society through that kind of thing with me being headlines um, and people trying to uh, you know, de deconstruct all of that and put it back together of what made James do this kind of thing. I thought it's Tyler Helensky, how after he passed shortly, uh, everybody's out there trying to tell his story all of a sudden, how great a kid he was, how much he had to live for. They never saw it coming. What more could they have done? And I didn't want those conversations surrounding me. This is one of the reasons I really fought so hard to make it through after Tyler took his life. And I read all the reports the next couple of weeks about the great kid Tyler was. And I said, no, I'm gonna stay here and tell my story. Uh, I don't wanna be taking my own life and then having everybody talk about how great a guy I was. No, no, I'll talk about that. I'll let people know I made it through difficult times and I'm here to tell the story and to let them know also that they can make it through these very difficult times too. In 2019, the Seattle Public Schools established a department specifically focused on African-American male achievement. I know you're not running for the school board, you're running for mayor, but I'm curious if you have some thoughts on what are the biggest factors that will make a difference in closing the achievement gap between black boys and boys of other races? You know, I've been doing work in our African-American community for 40 years in Seattle, uh, belonging to virtually every African-American group in town, uh, a lot of us focus on education of our youth, especially our black boys. Uh, I've seen very little incremental progress over those 40 years of closing that achievement gap, making sure our kids graduate uh, from high school, which is the first, the first step onto a life of success and prosperity. Um, but around our state, you know, 50% of our kids of color drop out of high school before they reach high school. And so this is not good. Uh, where are they gonna go without a high school degree? And most likely only reading at eighth or ninth grade level uh, and doing math at that level, where are they gonna go? 
And so I've been pushing and pushing and pushing to make sure our African American community resets the bar to not only graduate from high school, that should be a given, but to go and graduate from a two or four year college institution. Uh, you need a college degree in this day and age to compete with the marketplace out there of other jobs. Um, the last 10 years I've been working in, in mainland China with a study abroad programs for the Chinese students. So I round up dozens and hundreds of kids, uh, high schoolers and university students, and they come and they, they perform very well in our high schools and our colleges here in the States. They go to some of the best universities in the country. Uh, but these kids have a drive, they have a vision, they have an expectation put on them by their parents and by themselves that they're gonna be number one in their class. See, so education is really emphasized as their, their pathway to success. And so I was telling some of our African-American community leaders the other day, I said, hey, you know, when all of the Asian kids come and go to our higher institutions of learning and all the Indian kids from the country of India come and go to our higher institution of learning, upon graduation, they're taking all the high tech jobs. They're taking the jobs that are paying three, four, five hundred thousand a year. Uh, and now, with the, the the huge migration of uh, immigrants coming across our southern border, and even though fifteen dollar minimum wage is in effect in most major cities, employers are going to find a way to pay them under the table, six dollars an hour, seven dollars an hour. And where does that leave our black and our brown kids? You know, without a high school degree and especially without a college degree. So we need to do a better job of getting our kids into the vocational trades, uh, you know, electricians and plumbers and carpenters and craftsmen. Those are great jobs, great union jobs that are six figure incomes. So graduate from high school and then get into one of the trade schools and learn a craft that you can have for the next 40 years of your working life. And that's the best way that we can finally get up and out of this and close that disparity gap that we have, this achievement gap. I tell our groups the same thing, you know, yeah, we honor a half dozen kids a year who make it on to college, but what about the a thousand other kids who didn't make it? What, what happens to them? We don't know. We don't have any tracking of what happens to them. Most likely they end up on the street or they end up gang banging somewhere, or they end up incarcerated. Uh, if they're boys. And this is just a travesty of the Black community. So we can do better. And if I was uh, a school board member, I would be voicing that same kind of opinion. And as mayor, as a mayor who's an African-American male positive role model, I will be uh, explaining the same kind of conversation to our communities of color. This is our way to success in our lives and to generational wealth. We've got to be educated. We've got to stay out of the criminal justice system. We've got to be able to put together families and raise them responsibly. Do those three things and you're gonna have a life of prosperity and success. Yeah, initially we had a tremendous amount of very positive publicity. Since then, I mean, none of the candidates are really getting much publicity now anyway, except when they enter into the race and they oh. get their little flash. But we had, tremendous amount of really great uh, coverage back in March 4th when we entered into the race. Uh, since then, I think they're waiting to see who's going to rise up, especially in the money raising compartment, uh, which is where we're lacking a little bit. We need to get money into our coffers to make it look like we're a real serious, legitimate campaign. We're going for the democracy vouchers right now, uh, which would be another 400000 into our campaign once we qualify for that. So that's kind of our strategy. We feel like by mid-June, we should have that money in our accounts and then, then we're off and running and on the debate stage with all the other candidates. You know, and that's, that's another thing as mayor, I would work on bringing the Sonics back, of course. So uh, I think I have better chance than the other candidates to be in touch with the NBA and, and really make that work. So I'm in touch with them now, but uh, uh, there's no plans to do anything right now.